We're going to pick up uh, with the ending parts for the Windows and Linux lectures and cover rootkits, and then we're going to dive into today's lecture. Um, so does anyone not know what a rootkit is? Can you explain it anyway? Do I have to? It's basically malicious code. It's not always malicious code, but it's basically code that's been injected into kernel space. Okay. So who builds them? We went over that. Um, we're going to, yeah, getting into the kernel. Um, so last time I talked about these things called kernel mode drivers. Um, and uh, it's the official sanctioned channel by Microsoft to gain access to the hardware. It operates at ring zero. You usually find them in uh, system32 slash drivers. And they're almost always .sys files. They offer high complexities, and you can do a lot with them. And they're not too difficult to code. There's lots of books out there, both good and bad books out there, on how to code kernel mode drivers for the purposes of rootkits. Um, however, they're not stealthy. Uh, adding something to the, the kernel through this route leaves a lot of uh, logs in the system logs, and will probably set off IDS flags if the host based intrusion detection system is set up properly. Um, but they're like training wheels for rootkit design um, and can be loaded by user space applications. So the general channel is that a uh, user executable contacts the Windows 32 API and then that goes through NTDLL. The sysend or system call is uh, triggered and the kernel handles that with uh, kernel interface fast call entry and that interfaces with the system calls and then pretty much at the lowest level you can get is the I.O. manager system. Um, and the I.O. manager system communicates with other drivers that are operating in the kernel space with a thing called I.O. request packets. Oh, we covered that. Um, and then this, the kernel mode drivers, um, basically uh, have to play ball with the API provided by the hardware abstraction layer, uh, DLL. And then basically it can touch the hardware. So we talked about code signing. Um, code signing does work. Um, when 64 Windows came out, all kernel mode drivers had to be digitally signed. Um, but attackers can still piggyback on this process, and we covered this last time. So how attackers can get around code signing is they can get a job at a valid company that has a code signing certificate and introduce their back doors there. Um, that somewhat falls along the lines of espionage in the traditional sense. Um, or attackers can uh, put together a front for a company or a website and purchase their own uh, certificate to publish code. Um, but that's extremely brazen. <laughs> There's only been a couple instances of that, and that's pre been purely for uh, proof of concept research. Basically, at Researchers had an idea for ways the kernel could be uh, attacked with a certain new rootkit idea, and they wanted to contact Microsoft about it. Microsoft didn't want to hear it, so they didn't let them do the research. So what they did is they basically opened up a company, bought uh, po uh, the certificate, and did the research that way, and then released it at some conference. And then Microsoft basically shut down the certificate. But the research was done, so you know it worked. Uh, alternatively, instead of basically going through the normal channel, you can attack existing kernel mode drivers. <coughs> Windows is a very flexible platform that's been designed to, uh, to handle uh, hundreds of different hardware types. Um, and so there are hundreds of drivers. Um, often these are pr uh, programmed by third parties, and sometimes these third party co uh, companies don't have a lot of employees. Sometimes the people coding these have never taken a security class at all, have no idea really about uh, this, the normal security stuff that we would be concerned about. So here's where kernel mode driver exploits come in. You can attack these drivers. Um, it's, not, it's not too difficult, and you're statistically likely to find bugs in these drivers um, because there's so many of them. Um, however, attacking them requires being a master of stack overflow, shell code, return oriented programming, et cetera, stuff we will go over. Um, and uh, I can never pronounce her last name right, but Joanna Rutkowska, 
she's a prominent uh, rootkit researcher, and she claims that this is the most generic attack type today. Um, basically, the payload for any kernel mode driver exploit is another kernel mode driver that uh, gets loaded into kernel space. It leaves little footprints, is very stealth, and allows just as much capabilities as a normal kernel mode driver. Another way is modifying call, ta call tables and hooking. Um, <coughs> we covered how, how executables import and export functions through the, uh, the call tables and the headers of the PE file format last time. And so the kernel has its own uh, call tables. It has the IDT, it has the MSRs, the GDT, the SSDT, and the IO request packet dispatch table. Um, these can all be hooked if you have permission to do so. So if an attacker has basically administrative permission and is able to access these, he can modify them and hook his own uh, routines in their place. So for instance, the IRP dispatch table, that's uh, used by all devices, um, especially keyboards. And so they can hook that and log any keystrokes. So that's interesting. Um, it's still challenging. Um, there are multiple top copies of these uh, call tables, though, that exist in kernels. Um, often on hardware that are multi-core, uh, you will have uh, a copy of each table per core. So that introduces challenges for attackers there. Common targets are processes, drivers, files and directories, registry keys, and network ports. <coughs> the basics are, for hooking, you save the existing entry that's in the original call table, then you swap in your new address, and when you're done, you want to restore the old address. Well, that's common. Uh, the reason that's common is just like any sort of software design, when you're changing things, it's a good idea to restore them to the original state. That makes it easier to debug. Because rootkit designers are just like any other software designers. When you're modifying, th especially when you're modifying things in the kernel, if you leave something in a bad state, it can be a mess to clean up. So it's always a good idea when working with the kernel uh, for good guys and bad guys, if you make a modification and you intend to you know, leave it in the state you found it, make sure to undo any modification you do when you're done with your code. Um, <coughs> so yeah, that's usually left over from the development of any rootkit, if you see that in a rootkit, um, using hooking. So the next step is to block any calls made by certain applications. Rootkits do this to prevent antivirus from, look, from inspecting call tables and discovering them. Um, and then the my, my, uh, most important step is to entirely replace the original routine with your own code that you've now pointed the call table to. Um, it, your code could be something as simple as write all the keystrokes to a new file and then send that out every now and then to your malicious computer. Um, and then monitor a uh, system by intercepting input parameters. Uh, Pretty straightforward. Filter the output parameters uh, and then perform malicious code routine and then call the original code routine if you want to. So in other words, if you, if you write a hook, you don't have to rewrite the entire original routine. You just have to do your little additional stuff and then call the original routine and pass along all the parameters to it. That's, the, that's the, in essence what hooking is. Um, good guys and bad guys use this. Uh, it has been used uh, in the past by system administrators uh, when there's a critical vulnerability an operating system that, that hasn't come out with a patch yet. Microsoft usually rolls out patches on Tuesdays. Uh, that it's been known for system administrators to uh, use hooking to modify vulnerable system calls to simply basically uh, do filtering of input parameters so that it can't be exploited. <coughs> so hooking countermeasures that defenders can use is that hooking can be really easy to detect. Um, there are known good address ranges uh, for the destinations for these call <coughs> tables. Uh, all the drivers should occur in the same space in memory, and all the uh, other tables all also point to similar spaces of memory. It's, it's, uh, thus, it is possible to f have address bounds 
for where call tables should point to make it impossible for some uh, attacker to point outside of that to their own <coughs> malicious code. However, that, what that means is attackers then want to get their attack code inside that boundary and the cost of that means they have to find somewhere that will work and also make their code as compact as possible. So also um, attackers can get around this um, because all hooking checks use the same system call function to check the call tables and it's ZW query system information. If you hook that and filter for any information on the call tables, you can replace, you can, you can relay back bogus information to the user and they won't be able to detect your hooking. Um, and this brings us to an alternative technique called detour patching, um, where you leave the call table alone, but you go to the original routine and just add a jump instruction in there. <coughs> Cut off at the bottom. So the fourth way of getting into the kernel is basically patching it. Um, there are two main types of patching. There's binary patching, which, which involves patching the, the binary on disk. Binary is basically the machine code. It's what happens when it's compiled, assembled. Um, and then there's runtime patching, which means modifying the kernel executive in memory. It's super hard to detect the latter. It's really easy to detect uh, any modifications to the kernel on disk. Um, modifications to the kernel on disk are called, uh, when used in rootkits, are uh, categorized the rootkits as bootkits because they require the system to reboot in order for the system to be infected. And they're really simple to detect. Basically, you can check the file on disk against known good, and if it's not known good, then you know it's been modified. So that's simple. And it brings us to the way uh, code can be patched. Um, so for runtime patching, um, you can either patch a routine in place. So if it's, t if it's 20 bytes long, you only use 20 bytes to do your malicious code and perhaps also implement the original functionality or perhaps not. Um, this, this method is quite limited. The preferred method for rootkit design is detour patching where you just simply insert one instruction to the original routine, jump to wherever your uh, hook is. Um, it's quite simple. <sighs> So once attackers get into the kernel, they really like to stay there because it's hard work. Um, they're always looking for ways to retain access across reboots and even updates. Um, I think, uh, well, maybe I'll talk about that later. Um, so there's ways to protect against this uh, that have been out for a while now. Um, kernel patch protection uh, was introduced with patch guard. Basically, when PatchGuard runs, it's a, a core system service. Um, it does periodic ch checks on core components against known good signatures or entire copies uh, for the kernel, the hardware abstraction layer, uh, the CI.dl. That's, that's the, the DL that uh, uh, provides all the functions for code integrity checks. Um, and the rest of the uh, following core services, most notably TCP IP to prevent any backdoors being directly implemented in the networking drivers that run in kernel mode. <coughs> However, um, there are ways attackers can get around this. Because these are periodic checks, they occur every few milliseconds. If an attacker only needs to modify the kernel for a few microseconds, they can modify it, do whatever they need, and then restore it to its original state and it will pass the patch guard test. So another thing that hackers can do is patch guard also operates at ring zero. It has the same permissions as the attackers, so attackers can turn it off. Nothing's preventing the attackers from turning it off. So how Microsoft has combated this to prevent people from either turning it off or editing patch guard to, hey, just don't check these things, it's all cool, is that Microsoft combats this with crazy amounts of co code obfuscation. 
Um, there's some truth to code uh, obscure, uh, security through obscurity, but in a sense, it, uh, it, it's a brittle form of security that once it breaks, it's broken for good. Um, in that if the secrets are found out, then they're found out for good. It doesn't matter how much you obfuscate it, someone's gonna be able to reverse engineer it with the details that have been leaked. Um, so this website is a wonderful resource. It's uninformed.org. Uh, it's populated with all sorts of uh, things that are learned from reverse engineering all the internals of Windows and all the things that Microsoft doesn't want you to know. And it's all out there in the public. Um, it's not really underground, it's just, I, I don't know who runs it, but it's an interesting place to learn. So here are some theoretical countermeasures. Both hooks and detour patches modify constructs that are pretty static. So in theory, it's possible to safeguard them by explicitly reconstructing these call tables and these routines that the call tables point to with known good versions every now and then or very frequently. Um, so you can do this with uh, checksum based signature detection or direct binary detection for the, for the, uh, for the routines. But you can still break this, and this is through a popular technique called direct kernel object manipulation, acronymed as DCOM. Um, basically, you modify the data tables, the data structures inside the kernel to do what you need. So there's a process table. You can hide your process by removing it. Um, so objects in, in this category are really just abstractions for system resources. They're not, they have nothing to do with objects in the sense of object-oriented programming. Um, the objects here are just, just basic C structures and uh, changes to any objects are handled by a, a system called the object manager subsystem. So common targets are the E process object that's used by attackers to hide a process. The driver selection object can be used for loading and hiding malicious kernel mode drivers. And then the token object um, is an important part of authentication. Um, when you log in with the username and a credential, the system grants you a security token. That's handled by the token object within the kernel. If an attacker can subvert that, it doesn't matter what your password is. It doesn't matter how many times you change it either. And so on and so on. There's more countermeasures and counter countermeasures and it goes on and on and on to an extent. Um, any questions on this? We're going to dive into Linux. Okay. So how do you detect the root? So there's a lot of EXEs out there uh, um, that are offered by ant antivirus companies uh, that check it through these various means. There's no, it, when, in, in some of the later cases with DCOM and stuff like that, uh, is possible with, is possible in rootkit design to be completely undetectable. But the ways rootkits are discovered are by basically checking those routines, those common routines that attackers use. Like I said, the, there's one system call for looking <coughs> up call table information. There's common things that attackers go for. And so uh, antivirus companies can release rootkit detectors that check these routines that the call tables call against known good versions. Basically by not going through those routines, just by hard memory lookups in memory. Um, so that, and I think I listed some other ways. Does that answer your question? OK. So the rootkit talk for Linux is extremely similar. Um, here we have loadable kernel modules, which are basically the same as kernel mode drivers. Then we're going to go over hooking, direct DCOM, kernel object hooking, and runtime kernel memory patching. We've basically covered all these things, but I just want to show you how they're, the two operating systems are not that different in the attack theory. So loadable kernel modules in BSD, they're called kernel loadable objects. Um, this entire talk is from uh, the book Designing BSD Rootkits. So I've tried to make sure it all applies to Linux in theory. Um, 
And so loadable kernel modules are all .ko files, and they contain uh, object, uh, they're object files that contain code to extend the kernel, and these will operate at ring zero when they're loaded. It is also the official sanctioned way of modifying the kernel with driver code. Almost all of them are located in slash lib slash modules. And you can actually completely disable uh, a loadable kernel module loading uh, in the file proc sys kernel modules underscore disabled. I think you, there's just a flag in there. Um, and like kernel mode drivers, they allow key logging, backdoors, and anything you would be able to do in kernel mode drivers. And they're not stealthy in this case either. They do leave uh, uh, messages and logs when they're loaded. We went over hooking. Um, basically, the main purpose of hooking is to subvert the, uh, the operating system's application programming interface. DCOM, um, we discussed how uh, the proc directory in Linux is not an actual directory. It doesn't exist on disk, it's virtual. Um, and it contains all the information on all the processes that are running. So since that's stored in memory, um, you can basically modify the objects in memory to hide processes as you wish. So attacks here actually face synchronization issues because any, mo any modification you make to the objects in memory can get uh, interrupted if you don't lock uh, what you're doing with mutexes or whatnot um, by the process schedule because the process schedule <coughs> is going to have this context switching algorithm running and checking that object routinely. So you have to get in, make your change before you're, you're interrupted. Otherwise, uh, a crash can happen or kernel panic can result. Um, <coughs> so here, kernel object hooking is very similar to uh, direct kernel object manipulation, but instead you just use hooks uh, instead of just data state changes. So <coughs> devices are defined by their entries in the device table, and simply you can hook the address for the device in the device table. And so things like character devices, keyboards, have entries in a thing called the character device switch table. You simply put a hook there and then you have a key logger. Um, so this is nothing really new. It's just a combination. Um, <coughs> so this brings us to runtime kernel memory patching. Um, slash dev kmem is a special file. It's a device file. It allows reading and writing to kernel virtual memory just like a reading and writing to a file. Everything's a file in Linux. That's an important thing to remember. Um, <coughs> It allows attackers to patch various code bytes loaded in executable memory space that can control the logic of the kernel. Um, at, and at this level, you're working all with bytecode. So the example algorithm is that you, if you wanted to uh, attack, if you wanted to replace the code for make dir, which is make new directory, make new folder in Linux, the algorithm would be basically uh, retrieve the in-memory uh, of the make their syscall, basically the bytecode. Save however big it is. Uh, well, let's see. So then you save however, you, you save your attack code. In this instance, we're just going to replace it with K malloc, for an example. Uh, the size of that into the make their uh, space. You, which overrides it. This will cause kernel panic and uh, can cause a crash. But after that, um, you call make dir and if you want to restore the original functionality, you restore it when you're done. Um, so this is a pretty good book. It's a short read. I recommend it. And we're going to jump into today's talk. Any questions on rootkits? Oops, I want to add a new. Good. OK. So source code security and auditing is very important. Um, we're gonna, this is the outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction. We're going to talk about CVEs, CCs, CWEs. 
These are all organized by the Mitra Corporation. They're very important for any, uh, anyone entering the security industry. Um, we're going to go over common programming errors and bugs, and we're going to do some source code auditing. Um, these are some wonderful uh, resources. Uh, the Common Vertibilities Exposures website, we'll get to in a second, um, is su supplemented by the Common Weakness Enumeration and the Common Configuration Enumeration. Um, I'm going to pull up this, and we're going to go over it later. Hopefully it'll show up. Okay. Uh, but what should be most interesting to you guys is the National Vulnerability Database. It's run by NIST. Um, I went to this this morning and it absolutely made my day. Um, personally, I generally dislike Oracle. Um, and when I went here today to find you guys some vulnerabilities, the first four pages, every single entry was about <laughs> an Oracle product. Whether it's VirtualBox, some sort of tools. I'm going to show you guys. I'm going to just control F Oracle and it's going to highlight it and you're going to see a page, four pages full of things about Oracle vulnerabilities. So that just made me kind of feel good. It made my day. So. Oh, they've released one, two, three, four, five. Five new ones since I checked it this morning. But Oracle, 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 Oracle. All these are Oracle. Um, I mean, I'm just going to jump to page four. Um, some are PeopleSoft tools. Some are the application performance management tool. Um, applications framework component in Oracle eBusiness Suite. Uh, Sun Solaris 9 and 10. Uh, unspecified vulnerability. Um, it's kind of slow, so I'm not going to go to page two and three, but I'm just going to jump to page four, and you're going to see a, a sea of Oracle. <sighs> I'll come back to it. Okay. So, um, CVEs, CVE stands for Common Vulnerability and Exposure, is a list of information security vulnerabilities that aims to provide common names for publicly known problems. The goal of this whole list is to make it easier to spread and share data, both in-house, in your own security or uh, wing, between divisions and giant corporations, <coughs> between companies, between researchers, between system administrators. Um, and most importantly, makes it easier to spread and share data across vulnerability <coughs> databases. There's more vulnerability databases than just the National Vulnerability Database. It's run by MITRE, or MITRE, I don't know what the correct pronunciation is. Uh, MITRE, okay, it is MITRE. Um, and CVE should be taught in all software engineering classes. Um, raise your hand if you covered CVEs in your software engineering class. None of you. I'm not surprised. I didn't learn it either. Um, so they're intended to be a comprehensive list of publicly known vulnerabilities and exposures. And a vulnerability is defined, this is the definition we will use in our class, as a mistake in software that can be directly used by a hacker to gain access to a system or a network. An exposure is a mistake in software that allows access to information or capabilities that can be used by a hacker as a stepping stone into a system or a network. So perhaps if you, in the previous case we talked about in our disclosure debate series, uh, the instance where AT&T's website was leaking all the personal information for iPad users, that's an exposure. It didn't allow them access into the website or the website server, but it exposed all the sorts of information that could perhaps be used to attack people. So that's still a serious problem. <coughs> CCE stands for Common Configuration Enumeration, and the CCE list is the purpose is to assign unique identifiers to configuration guidance statements, and configuration guidance statements are essentially Things like the required permissions for accessing the directory system root, system32 setup should be restricted to administrator account only. Basically, these are guidelines on the way systems should be set up. Um, so, and then for uh, password attempts, the lockout threshold should be three failures. 
it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, another very important one is the common weakness enumeration. Um, a software weakness, this is an important definition in the class as well, is an error that may lead to a software vulnerability, um, such as those enumerated by the common vulnerabilities and, and uh, exposures. <coughs> Example weaknesses include buffer overflows, format string errors, integer overflows, uh, exception handler errors, uh, structure and validity problems, um, channel and path errors, uh, <laughs> path traversal errors. Um, actually, that may be a configuration. And yeah, these are more authentication errors, resource management errors. Um, that's important for uh, considering denial of service. If all your resources get taken up, you may not be able to serve your website anymore. Um, insufficient verification of data. A lot of security comes down to input validation. Like in your classes for software engineering, every other word should have been input validation. Like they should have really hammered it that bad into your brain. Um, so it's important to note that weaknesses are a subset of bugs. And this is a good diagram um, to understand, put it all together. So with all sufficiently large code, it's statistically likely that there are going to be a certain amount of bugs for every thousand lines. And statistically, a percentage of those bugs are going to be weaknesses. And a subset of those weaknesses are actually going to be vulnerabilities. And a subset of those vulnerabilities, perhaps when combined with exposures, are going to be exploited by attackers. So exploits can leverage other things outside of this diagram as well. <sighs> so when programs are loaded into memory, they are broken into many small sections. In general, it's the same in Windows and Linux. Um, you have a te dot text section. The dot text section actually contains all the machine code instructions and it's permission wise set to read only. Attackers can't go to this section and insert their own uh, code to replace your original code. It's not permitted. Um, and then there's the dot data section, which holds any global, globally initialized variables, and dot BSS is also for uh, global variables. Um, heap section is for any dynamically allocated uh, memory used with malloc, calloc, any of the alloc functions. Um, there's the stack section, which is used for local variables. Um, and also environmental variables. Um, and then, yeah, there's environmental <laughs> variables and arguments. <clears throat> so there's three main ways to discover vulnerabilities. We're gonna go over all of them. Next week, we're gonna, it's all gonna be about reverse engineering. And then we're gonna go into fuzzing after that and dive into the deep end of, of uh, exploit development. Hopefully we get through polymorphic shell code design and have you guys do some of that. Um, and expose you guys to return-oriented return programming, but it's too difficult to require you guys to do that. So source code auditing is what we're here for today, and uh, it is tedious and time-consuming. Talking about time-consuming, let's see if that page has loaded. Yes, even more Oracle vulnerabilities. So many. So many. Every single one. Really, really made my day. Just pages of Oracle <coughs> vulnerabilities. Some are for MySQL. And then there's PeopleSoft again. There's something called Siebel CRM. I've never even heard of that. Uh, Oracle Universal Work Queue, included in the eBusiness suite. Um, I mean, it's a good thing these things are being found. It doesn't mean Oracle's the worst. There could be other vendors that are way worse and no one's found their vulnerabilities. But it kind of made my day. All right. So it's really hard to estimate how much time it's going to take to do a proper audit of any given source code. Um, the code may be well documented with good comments, but upon inspection, the comments could be useless. Um, and the code logic could be convoluted and really take a lot more time than you anticipated to figure out. 
Another thing is that it requires a high degree of knowledge and skill with the given language that you're reading. So there are some approaches. Maybe you're interested in finding the most bugs or finding the easiest bugs to find. Um, I suggest, however, the most important approach is finding weaknesses that are the most reliable to exploit. And those are commonly also some of the easiest to find bugs. Um, it's very important to limit your approach, your goals, basically, when doing source code auditing, because you're not going to have enough time to find all the bugs. Never. Um, I think there's been studies uh, that are basically surveys of companies uh, that were designed to find out how much time would it take to find all the bugs in their products and fix all of them. And it basically came out to a cost that was way greater than all the profits that they've made so far. <coughs> because it's that time uh, intensive. <coughs> so here's the general methodology. You have to first and foremost understand the application and understand what it's doing. First thing you should do is read the specs or the documentation because you really want to understand the purpose of the application and the business logic of it. Then you want to understand the attack surface. The attack surface basically uh, involves the inputs, the configuration, um, any components it interfaces with. And then lastly, you want to identify uh, target components that an attacker would hit. So you have to think like an attacker really to defend better. So components that some code may interface might be a database on the back end for some website. So an attacker would definitely want to hit that database. Um, other things they might be interested in, if you have any file uh, transmission capabilities, they may want to upload a file, upload a backdoor or something like that. Uh, they may want to uh, spawn a shell. Um, so the way to really read source code when doing security auditing best is to think like an attacker. And <coughs> there's a traditional way to do that. Um, where you basically look at import sources and you trace how they are treated through the uh, code. You basically you draw a little path through the code, what inputs are doing. Um, for both data, man uh, data <coughs> management and other stuff. Um, and then also focus on any security mechanisms. Authentication is basically one of the, if you have code for authentication, that's probably gonna be your starting point logically. That's the first place an attacker would try to attack. Um, but also, uh, co really complex stuff. Um, anything that uses complex protocols, SSL is a really complex protocol. Perhaps it wasn't implemented right because the developer didn't understand it because it's really difficult. Um, or complex parsing of perhaps file formats. Some, maybe something's encoded really weird and the developer didn't understand it right and he maybe implemented it in a buggy way. Or there's a meta way to do it. <coughs> you start by searching the source code comments with like grep or something like that. You look for curse words, that something that really ticked off the developer. That's a good indicator that maybe he didn't understand that. And maybe a, somewhere to start attacking. Um, or anywhere that says to do, or I need to fix this, or I'll get to this later, or XXXXX, or any flags that could be used to indicate, hey, I need to keep working on this. Um, Another great tip is if you have access, if you have access to like a Git repository or uh, <coughs> Mercurial, uh, look for code checked in at late night. Um, Moxie Marlinspike, I think, interviewed uh, the one of the core designers for SSL when he was working at Netscape, um, and he said that SSL was largely a 4 a.m. decision or a series of 4 a.m. decisions. And code checked in at this late time when all your coffee's worn out and you're mentally exhausted may have more bugs in it than other times in the day. <coughs> and another way to think like an attacker if you have access to this uh, type of data, if you have witnessed a certain developer making lots of errors, it may be more beneficial to you to keep looking at his code as opposed to other people's codes. In other words, pick on the, the weak ones uh, when doing security audits. Basically, security, your security is only as good as your weak, weakest link. 
So you got to bring everyone up to bar. And sometimes that's the way to do it. So often when you're looking at buggy code by the same developer, you'll discover patterns in the way they write things. Um, and that can be uh, really, that can speed up the process of looking for uh, problems. <coughs> so reading code can be really, really frustrating. Um, it can be completely uncommented. The comments could be from various people and all of them could have not understood what they're doing and it could only confuse you more. So my, my suggestion um, uh, and the suggestion <coughs> of many industry experts is to read iteratively, try to understand each component as you read it and always try to keep an image of the big picture. Um, always try to skim past filler code because that can really slow you down. S you know, skip past things like function prototypes, uh, constructors, you know, macros, uh, you know, initial or hard-coded stuff, global variables like that, um, and any sort of abstraction. Though abstraction can be important, all these things could be important in uh, vulnerability, but they're not going to. The, they themselves are not going to be the vulnerability. So <clears throat> sometimes it is important to look at abstraction. Um, some developers, yes, question. Yeah. When, um, when you're looking at obfuscating code, some of that stuff has to change because they're purposely trying to abstract things or purposely trying to Yes. Abstract. It really helps to refactor variable names, you know. But your question. Those kind of part of would you fundamentally look at obfuscating code? From being in competitions where I victimized my attacker to obfuscated code and was also the victim of trying to reverse engineer it, um, none of this really applies because you're trying to, they, there's, there's effort in making code readable and well documented and that changes when the, 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 the ease of readability completely <coughs> changes when someone's obfuscating the hell of it so you can't read it. You can't figure out what's going on. It's a completely different task. It's a completely different problem trying to figure out what's going on in obfuscated code and reverse engineering it. Um, so some of this stuff will not apply. Uh, so when developers like to use abstraction, sometimes they love to use abstraction and they overuse it. Um, and when they overuse it, it can be misused. And this in itself can be uh, uh, instrumental in vulnerabilities. Um, and also another thing is to focus on code patterns. So there's various tools out there. There's all your source code editors, whether you're a Vim, VI, or Emacs person, or you just love Notepad++. Um, and then there's uh, actually pattern matching tools. Um, these are actually good for finding uh, improperly implemented functions. We'll get to that later. Um, like, if you, if, you, if you use a function that's intended to be a safer way of doing something, like string copy as opposed to stir copy, you know, the one with the n in it, and you give it the wrong input parameter, like you give it the, the string length of something wrong, you can use pattern matching to actually find <coughs> that um, with maybe 10, 20 lines of Python, actually. Um, so, <laughs> This actually also leads to static analyzers. Um, static analyzers, there's tools that do this, but they're prone to missing vulnerabilities. They'll find bugs. But they're prone to missing vulnerabilities and they also give a lot of false positives, which can be a real time waster. Um, but the most important one I'd suggest is really you can't give up pen and paper. Um, you don't really want to leave your own comments and code as you're trying to figure out someone else's code. Um, you prefer to not touch it. Um, Though, if you're fixing bugs, that's obviously where you want to, when you want to change it. Um, but pen and paper is really <coughs> important. Anyways, um, so <coughs> implementation bugs are basically bugs in the way code was implemented. And it can allow attackers to make the application behave in unintended ways. The main causes are failure to validate input, a failure on the programmer's part to understand uh, abstract programming interface, or miscalculations failure to perhaps validate results, um, and application state failures. Um, <coughs> other causes can be complex protocols, complex file formats, uh, complex encoding or decoding uh, types, um, 
Improper Unicode inspection is something I hope we'll cover later, if I remember it, um, and can be used by attackers to perhaps upload shellcode in some instances. Um, and also, other causes can be trusting the validity of the input and thus failing to do uh, validation checks. Um, perhaps if you're somewhere along the chain on the inside of a program, perhaps you trusted the previous parts to do sufficient checks, but perhaps there are inputs in some other part in that process that an attacker could exploit. Um, also, failure to track uh, relationships, object references, pointers, etc. Um, often overlooked bug type are integer overflows. Um, integer overflows occur when basically a numeric value, say a result of arithmetic operation, is, w is too large for the storage space. And what occurs is basically a modulo wraparound. Um, it does not overflow in the way buffer overflows, overflow into adjacent data. Um, so um, in some instances, it may wrap around all the way to zero, just like this diagram of an odometer once it reaches the max value. Or for processors like GPUs or digital signal processors, when a value is too big, it will return, the processor will return basically a constant which is max value and will be whatever the maximum value for that processor's uh, bit amount of bits in a byte. Could be eight bits, could be any other amount, but it's usually always going to be eight bits. <coughs> so this cannot lead to memory corruption in, in most cases, but if it's used as an index or an array pointer, it can. So, yeah, here's the C99 uh, C standard, and it dictates uh, that the result is always modulo. Um, and the quote is that computation involving unsigned operands can never overflow. Um, or underflow is another type of integer, basically, error, and it occurs in subtraction. Um, so, in the following code, if you have on a, in a line unsigned int x equals zero minus one, it's going to actually return what you try to use x next time to the 16 minus one. And that leads to signedness error, which we'll cover next slide. And also truncation occurs when you take a 32-bit integer and try to store it in a 16-bit integer. Those most significant 16 bits are gonna get thrown away. <coughs> So this is basically, uh, this is here for you to visualize it easier. Um, so on the left, everything's signed, and the most significant bit is the sign bit. So when that's set to one, the negative sign is present. Um, so in the cases all one, 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 it's gonna be negative one. And for unsigned integers, in the cases one, 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 it's gonna be two, four, five. <laughs> That's simple stuff. You guys all know that. <coughs> so here's an example of a code with an integer overflow or underflow or integer error bug in it. Can anyone spot it? So what we have is an unsigned short. And we call that length. And this function is taking in an unsigned int called input length. And what we do is we, we put input length into length and we check it to see if it's greater than, I guess, our maximum allowed value, which is 1024. And return true if it does, and return false if it's, I guess, okay. Who sees a problem here? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So you basically, you, this is a truncation error. So <coughs> this is somewhat similar. Um, <coughs> So this is some networking code. Um, it's for reading from a socket. And basically we have a character buffer that's 4096 in length. And we also have um, <coughs> an integer that we define as length. And we basically read uh, how much bytes we have to read. And we store that into length. 
and then we check if length is less than the maximum socket buffer size, and if it is, we read. Who sees the problem here? Not exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, no, that's not the problem. This is, it's not that the size of the integer is four bytes in the first instance of read. Um, basically, if length is all Fs and hex, <coughs> if it's all ones, it's going to be negative one. So that's going to, that can be bigger than 4096. So it can read more than the buffer. And so if you send it a big packet, this uh, has the most significant bit set, um, it can cause a crash and lead to memory corruption actually, because you're telling it to read in more uh, data than is in the buffer. So an attacker can send shell code over the wire this way. So, that arrow did not render right. It's supposed to point to the line above it, read. So, but the question is, is will read still work? Uh, it only takes in unsigned integers for the size parameter. So it's not going to be a negative if it were unsigned. But in this comparison, <laughs> this is a comparison between two signed values. The if length less than max sock buff. Who thinks this will still work for an attacker? One guy? It'll still work for the attacker. Um, basically, uh, it, it will get converted, I think, by the compiler into an unsigned. So that will work. Question? No? OK. OK, so this is an attack on. Uh, that happened in 2001, a while ago, but I wanted to show you guys that these attackers broke SSH and they didn't have to break the crypto. They just directly attacked SSH and threw an integer overflow bug. So this is some more lengthy code. Um, <coughs> basically, my hints here are look at, uh, always look at the, the size of the variables and it happens somewhere in here. Any ideas on which line of code actually will lead to integer truncation, overflow, underflow? Yeah? Are we looking for the, the exploit that they use, or are we looking for Just the vulnerability. Oh. Just where the bug could occur. The exploit that they could use is also there, and I'll show you guys that. As a hint, this allows the attackers to uh, basically write to extra memory uh, other than was originally intended. Yeah. Close. Yes. Do you know why? Exactly. So, <clears throat> integer overflow uh, is a truncation, 32-bit word going into a 16-bit word where n equals l. Um, I really need to fix how this renders. Anyways, those arrows should all be pointing from exploitable code that leads to memory corruption. So that allows us uh, to do uh, x malloc, uh, a greater number than was originally intended because of the n factors in there. Um, and then the inner for loop here, where h sub i equals j, is actually exploitable code that allows attackers to corrupt memory and insert also shell code. So this brings us to buffer overflows. Um, buffer overflows have been around since the 80s. And unfortunately, they're not going away. And the main reason <coughs> is people can't code. I mean, you guys didn't have input validation as every other word in your classes. so who's I mean, it's not your fault. <laughs> so uh, buffer overflows basically result when too much data is being put in too small space. In the case of strings and other data that's not integers, is the remaining data is going to put into a adjacent memory. Um, <clears throat> and from my experience, uh, in most companies and corporations, uh, 
the majority of like software developers are actually like engineers, and they've never taken a security class. Um, so if you actually learned uh, security practices in your software engineering or you know intro to programming classes, I guess I'd consider you pretty lucky. So this is a simple example of buffer overflow using an unsafe, you know, C string function. Basically, stir copy copies the first parameter is destination, second parameter is input. Um, it's really straightforward. It's unbounded copy. It will copy as much data as it takes until it finds a slash zero, a null byte. So that's really simple. <coughs> And so safe functions were introduced, and also safe APIs were introduced, but that doesn't prevent the developers from misunderstanding them and misusing them, perhaps giving them the wrong parameters, perhaps calculating the parameters wrong or in a buggy way. Um, so <coughs> this is actually common. Um, they still use string length in the safe or function, string copy, but it's the string length of the input, so it doesn't help at all. It's no different than stir copy. And it's actually quite common. Um, I think my buddy, yeah, Mitch, who's coming next week, uh, when we were in Vegas, he wrote a, like a 20 line Python program to detect this. It'll just, you give it, you just point it to source code files and it'll detect this. Basically, parameter one, parameter two, and string length of parameter two. And he ran it on, I think, uh, uh, VLC player source code. And they reported all this to their uh, forums. And they marked all of them as like critical vulnerabilities. So it was pretty easy to find those. So <clears throat> this is actually a reasonable case where a, a, a good developer might make this error. Can anyone spot the problem? There's, 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 th there's four string operations. None of them are unsafe. But one of them is, is actually a vulnerability. So basically, the code in the middle, um, we're doing some parsing of some delimiters. Maybe it's a file. As maybe, it's, maybe it's a spreadsheet or something. And we're parsing out delimiters, and we're getting the tokens. And we may do something with it. So I've cut it down to leave that logic out, because it's not important. Yeah? You write the output buffer, but you don't have to do it. The outstring? Yeah. That is it, but that's not the reason. Um, outstring could perhaps be hard coded to be 256 as well. Well, if you call trip out, you reassign it from. You reassign buff from trip out, so you're not at the start of buff. So this is true. Uh, the real reason this is a problem, though, is because size of it's still going to return 256. Even if you've cut it in half or done, you know, removed stuff from it. Size of is going to return 256 because size of is actually compiled, is calculated at compile time, not at runtime. And that's something a lot of developers don't actually know. So that was an interesting <laughs> case. I may use this code in one of your homeworks later for perhaps network exploit development. The last important case uh, is that I consider is meta character injection. Meta character injection is commonly used when applications use components that have, are written in different languages, or different interpreters, or basically interface with other components that are like databases, maybe libraries, code in other languages. Um, perhaps they outsource some calculations to the system shell, and then just run system, and then whatever they want to evaluate. <clears throat> it's really important to note how each component in an application handles meta characters and how bugs can be introduced. So these are really important cases of meta characters. Any code that can comment um, is really important. Minus minus in SQL will comment out the remainder of the line. So if I have some authentication code that wasn't properly input validated, and I enter in my username and password, and I put my username to be uh, admin, and then like end the string, and then 
Union, give me all the passwords, and then minus, minus. The SQL on the back end for that PHP will basically be select where admin, where username equals, and then our source code, our, our injected code begins, and it comments out the rest. It doesn't care about our check that we made as a developer to say where username equals this and password equals this MD5 or this hash of the given password. That will all be actually commented out. So it'll just return true. Okay, there's actually a record where someone's username is admin. What do you want to know? Um, so any, any uh, code that also allows for union or more commands, so in shell, a semicolon allows you to execute more commands in the same line. Also, piping is important too. Um, any wildcard symbols for uh, string matching, um, percent, sign, or asterisk are common ones. And string closure and start. Uh, let's see. And I'm going to start doing a demo. And this class is going to be heavy on demos from here on out. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of SQL injection of all the things that I discussed. And I have this little web server running uh, in a virtual machine. And this is what it looks like. It's basically like a little picture blog, a little JPEG blog, pretty useless website. Um, and as we explore it, um, we see there's various pages and they're written in PHP and there's this parameter question mark ID equals one so let's let's take note of that and keep going and ID is changed to two ID is changed to three there's I guess nothing let's go to all pictures and then there's no parameter there so the most common way people have detected SQL injection Vernable websites throughout the ages is in to, insert, to insert a meta character. Something as simple as a tick, you may not even be able to see it if you're in the back of the room, will cause SQL to spit out an error because you've caused the string construction in the SQL uh, statement to no longer parse correctly. So here we have a SQL uh, syntax error, and that tells us hey, we can actually inject code here. So a common way to do this is to basically union along with a whole other command. Um, so before we can start harvesting all the data that's in this database, we need to figure out what the SQL statement on this web page looks like. We need to figure out the number of parameters because the union function requires that the number of parameters in the first table of results equals the number of parameters in the second table of results. So a common way to do this is iteratively discover, select one. Okay, and I, just, I wanted to see if it only had one result, or one parameter that's basically selecting. Um, so SQL tells me that the use select statements have a different number of columns. So I'm gonna keep going. Let's try two. Same error. Let's try three. Same error. Let's try four. Okay, four it is. There's four parameters that SQL query is using to interact with the database. So, <clears throat> let's see. We'll get to SQL injection in a later uh, lecture. This is just a toy example I use to introduce concepts. So what this allows attackers to do is just do thing like I have this coded. Do something like get the password from the user's table, and then I can crack the 75 later and log in as an admin. So that's just a toy example. Um, I think that also concludes our lecture. You guys learn this as just a simple demonstration of meta character injection. So the conclusion when doing source code auditing is that important steps are to identify the targets and components and make sure that any interfaces with these components and anything that does authentication is totally bug free. And then worry about the main weaknesses and other stuff. Um, <coughs> always be smart about reading code. There's way too many bugs uh, for you, then 
you have time to fix and focus on weaknesses. So common weaknesses that commonly lead to exploitive vulnerabilities is anything that results in memory corruption. That's almost always going to lead to something that's exploitable. Almost always. Anything that causes an exception and thus triggers an exception handler. Attackers can replace exception handlers with their own shellcode. That's something that most developers don't know. Um, anything that results in crashes usually is also a sign of memory corruption. Anything that results in weird or invalid application states can perhaps allow attacker to do things uh, that they shouldn't have permissions to do. And also anything that allows meta character injection. Um, I guess another conclusion I should have listed is that when programming, because we're going to go into ROP chains, I say it's also extremely important to import and include as little as possible. So like in Python, you can import specific functions from a library. <coughs> do that. Don't import the whole library. And see, don't include things you don't need. In return-oriented programming, attackers don't inject shellcode. They don't insert malicious code into a program, into a memory space, because it's all already there. It just has to be all put in the right order and then run. So return-oriented programming is all focused on skipping around in the code and executing things in the right way so that you get slash bin pushed on the stack, slash sh pushed on the stack, and then you jump to system and you run it. That's just that's a general example. So there are ways attackers can exploit your code without having any uh, ways for them to upload or inject uh, malicious code into a process. So that concludes our lecture for the day. Uh, does anyone have any questions for next week? This can be really hands-on. If you haven't heard the spiel before, try bring a laptop with all the instructions I said. Um, it should be an email that was sent to your at my.fsu.edu email. Yes? Are there any files we should download other than the IDP? He's going to provide uh, some of the, the classroom exercises. And I think we'll probably just pass them around on USB or something, or a CD. Any questions? OK. You guys learned something? <coughs> Good. Nah, you won't need slap snapshots. Yeah. I was wondering what it was that you put in. I couldn't quite see from the back with like the.